would you believe me if I told you that graphite pencils, Pigma microns, and this giant tub of ink work the same way? Stay tuned to find out more. Hello and welcome to Stationary Test Drive, where usually for the last 51 weeks or so, uh, we have tested out stationery like this in artistic ways. Well, this is our fourth roundup episode. And if you've seen one of these before, uh, you know that we look at the things that we've done over the last 12 weeks, especially. Uh, and we have kind of like a, a discussion about how they are and interesting things about them. Like Samir said in the intro, these are four things in our first segment uh, that are kind of work the same and you wouldn't think that if you look at them. I'm Vishal. This is Ninjal. I'm Samir. And yeah, so the pencils. This is a carpenter's pencil, a regular pencil for drawing, a Pigma Migron fine liner, and my favorite, the Sumi drawing ink. Uh, we have made stuff with them, but Samir, tell me, why, why are they exactly the same? Or not exactly, but uh, these are all equipment, tools, stationery, art supplies, whatever you want to call them, that are all based on uh, drawing or writing with carbon. So they use exactly the same material as a pigment. Okay, so, so yes, through the magic of editing with these wonderful tools, this is what you can do with Sumi ink. I think all of us have used them. In, in this way. And I guess Sumi is the simplest thing because it's carbon plus water, yes. basically. Uh, what we're going to be doing through this episode is to walk you through, using the last 12 pieces that we did, a very quick history of the way uh, dyes, pigments, and the colors that actually go into everything that you draw and paint with work and the way they developed over time. Uh, Sumi ink is definitely one of the oldest kinds of ink there ever was. It's a carbon black in water, and that's really about it. There's nothing more to it. The oldest inks, and we have brought this up in various episodes, were actually just made from, um, you know, metal minerals mixed with water. So it was often the, the rust-colored rocks and those kind of things that were used to make a, a red color ink. The One of the first developed inks that were like properly processed was probably something like the Sumi ink. So after we went past, you know, using red colored rocks and green colored rocks to make very rudimentary coloring materials, which were probably the things that went onto cave walls. Mm -hmm. Once we had fire ah. and we figured out that there was this black stuff left over. Soot. We came up with carbon as a pigment. So carbon is one of the first yeah. properly developed pigments. And Sumi ink is one of the simplest, best examples of it. Mm. And uh, I think we, you don't get more rudimentary, but in some ways modern than this, I think. These are two pieces by Minjal that uh, I think we both loved the gray of it. Didn't yeah, we? So, uh, which is what I was saying, the Sumi black ink. Mm. But um, I think the grays are just so memorable. And uh, you may not have really, uh, you know, used the grey, but both Vishal and I really, yeah. I hmm. think, touched upon the fact that the Sumi ink is fantastic, you know, for like these washes. I think you can imagine yourself as a caveman sort of stumbling upon this and the kind of subtlety. Maybe you didn't, obviously, they didn't have paper back then, but I'm sure they had some kind of nice slate wall or something upon which these greys might have looked pretty much like this. Yeah. So it's a real prehistoric and uh, sort of a vast time uh, span that people have been making things exactly more or less like this, right? Maybe what we try, uh, you know, in the next season is get the Sumi ink sticks mm, with yes. the grinding stone. Right. I because, think that would be a we, nice... Because uh, the one we experience. tested, the one we tested is this uh, one from Daiso, which is a wonderful store. And it's very convenient because it just comes in this nice big 200 or so milliliter bottle. Uh, with a nice pourer. So you just pour it in and it's perfectly easy to use with a brush or a pen or mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but yeah, you, Minjal, you're right. The 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 sticks are also available. Yes, and that's, and kind that's, of, the, that's the traditional way of doing it. Uh, you have a carbon stick with mm. a binder in it and then you kind of grind it with water I'm, into a stone that's specially made for it. Usually. Yeah, I've seen these sort of like rough trays almost right. made of stone and then you press it against it and there's like it 
the ink mixes with the water and kind and of kind forms of see, a, yes, falls a reservoir. Yeah. yeah. Mm, we should definitely try that. Uh, but moving on to slightly less primitive things. Yes, and partly to do with what we talked about. Sumi ink, as we said, started, carbon inks in general, started off as solid inks, which you kind of then ground or mixed with water. Uh, the Pigma is actually exactly a carbon ink based pen. The innovation here was that the, the Pigma inks were obviously on an industrial level, if you want to think about it, ground to such a point that the pigment could go through these fine point pens. So it's like, imagine, if you will, this, but as a little tiny cartridge and with a little bit of, uh, is it felt or something like that at the end? Yeah, I'm guessing it's some sort of synthetic uh, felt tip. Right now, but I, even earlier on it may have been actual some kind of leather or something, something semi-porous that would allow you to form this. And certainly this has a nice metal tip here. Not the tip itself, but the metal almost like... The cladding. Cladding, yes, that's the correct word. Uh, our stationary terminology expert Minjal has come to the save us again. <laughs> but yes, the Micron is... Uh, Orders of magnitude finer. It's not just called a fine liner. It is actually fine. Uh, this is a 08 version. Which, which is, is one of the thickest ones. Actually, yeah. But, but Minjal, you got some... I, I don't think cavemen were capable of this. If they are, then unfortunately those have been lost to time. So I uh, we've uh, we covered the uni fine liners on our show earlier. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't really get to any stippling with them. But uh, stippling with the Pigma Microns was uh, really such a great experience. Yeah. Uh, they come in variety of sizes, the nib sizes. And the cladding actually ensures, you know, that even if you apply pressure, they don't really break. Yeah. Or, you know, they don't uh, get damaged. So really, I think Sakura has... Uh, created such a fantastic product with the Microns. Hmm. Well, Sakuras are wonderful and we've tried all sorts of the other ones, but maybe we should look at something a little more primitive uh, that is also carbon-based. Uh, and yeah, the, the, that's the... The strange thing is that we think of uh, pencils as something much more... Uh, primordial and ancient but in the relative scale of the history of stationery pencils Mm. are very new yeah Uh, carbon inks like the sumi uh, have been around in some form or the other for several thousands of years Mm. but graphite as a properly discovered material and used in pencils is only a few hundred years old right so i'm guessing figuring out the formula because this is a formula this is not you know, despite what people say, oh, it's a pencil lead. A, it's not lead. It's graphite. But B, very specifically B, to B, not to uh, labor too much of a point on it. <laughs> this is a mixture. This is like a chemical soup of graphite and clay and yeah, other it things. Was, it, was a, it was kind of a literally a kneaded together mixture of uh, soft clay and uh, graphite powder which was, this mixture was invented by the French uh, the very soon after the discovery no. of graphite itself. Mm-hmm. And that's what's gone into pencils for, well, since they started a few hundred years ago. We, of course, did this set using the Faber-Castell drawing pencils. Which we don't have right now, but they are, imagine one is right here. Um, and the the whole point of a drawing pencil set is of course the the varying gradation of pencils so the ones we had included some softer ones like the 4 and 6b and some you know harder ones like a 2b which is harder compared to a 6b but softer than an hb which is what you would normally use for writing the faber castell set was quite a lot of fun to use i think we the thing that we all found about it that it was great to be quite rough and loose with it mm. compared to some of the other um, things like the Stedler set that we have tried before. Yeah, I think I, I like that we always, in, in each of these kind of inadvertently or not, we come back to a pencil now and then because it's just, it is, it feels the most natural, I guess, you grow up, you use a pencil before you start getting into pens and things like that. You know, you get into crayons and we'll get into crayons later in this uh, episode and the kind of sort of the weird space where what is a crayon what is an oil pastel what is a color pencil what is a watercolor pencil kind of sits but right. when you want to draw you can't really go wrong with a pencil 
and in the development of colors uh, in stationery it's uh, the pencil is a very interesting and important step because it is actually a fairly modern invention yeah i even you would think that you'd go to black first but i'm guessing sepia crayons like the conte crayons in some ways are older yes it's a very modern invention using a technique which is carbon black in in this case through graphite which is one of the oldest ways that we had color so that was our these are the things that we covered that involve carbon and now we will go on to what came up next after the era of solid pigments like um metal and uh, various metal salts and things like carbon which were solid pigments that were ground and sort of put into a suspension into water the next innovation in coloring and um, materials used for writing and drawing were actually dyes now we didn't call them that in the beginning we just found flowers and plants which had colored materials in them we mixed them up with water and we got colored water and we used those to draw with our fingers initially or draw with reed pens and so all inks and uh, all sorts of dyes that we use in fabric all of these are water soluble dyes a very different material from things like carbon and that was the next big innovation in stationery as a whole so we have come out of the era of black and carbon black into the world of living color and we i do use the term living color because as some you said we started off with pigments and dyes that are almost certainly from living things like plants and yes uh, vegetables and things like that and flowers which were probably one of the first things that we used to you know smash into water and get a colored water out of yes and then later on especially for purples insects but that's a story that you should actually look up on qi maybe or youtube or on bbc yes but <laughs> speaking of flowers uh, the reason we started with the krishna inks which we really loved and are extremely vibrant mm-hmm. Uh, the reason we started with these is because a lot of them are plant based mm. you have the sindhur color which is traditionally a oxidized turmeric powder mm-hmm. traditionally anyway and the the kanikona which someone on our uh, original video very helpfully pointed out that kanikona is actually the the state flower of kerala which is a yellow cassia flower mm. and that's where this yellow comes from wow. so krishna inks very much is you know iconic for having this sort of plant based dye hmm. um so yes from the time of just uh, crushing some flowers in in a pot hmm. to this kind of refined ink the the krishna inks were really a lot of hmm. fun to use to to think that something that's genuinely that ancient hmm. is still so useful <laughs> and um, artistic today as a medium i wonder if there were you know fights between different schools of people the flower pickers and the lamp black suit cave <laughs> people you know because i'm sure some of this was happened at the same time i doubt that people were only working with carbon no there was there was a lot of overlap there was absolutely a lot of overlap and uh, i think we liked the overlap we got between you know mixing up the we had a yellow the kanikona and we had a blue which was the kozal and then we mixed the two to get this nice green uh minjal have you ever tried you know crushing flowers for making things uh, no i only use cartridge inks so <laughs> <laughs> oh she is a she is a connoisseur yes i'm sure i have she, some she she is a follower of the ancient religion of cartridge yes. <laughs> so uh, this was actually quite a discovery the hmm. krishna inks and uh, made in india and uh, like we uh, spoke about in our episode uh you should try and get your hands on these they are uh, really nice vibrant inks mm. uh, pretty much at par with anything that is being uh, manufactured on a large scale absolutely mm. and speaking of large scale i don't think you can get any more large scale than ikea the ubiquitous worldwide now but traditionally known to be swedish yeah, and, uh, and, furniture brand and just to just to it's a side note but going back to plants uh these ikea pencils have this wonderful wood uh casing. casing yeah and i i was just reading about ikea when we did this video ikea is responsible for or uses 1% of the entire world's wood production <laughs> wow so there you go plants are still part of it 
Yeah, and uh, coloring pencils, of course, are something that, like we talked about in the first segment, something that may have come in quite a bit later in terms of the chemistry and the, you know, if you think making a pencil obviously requires a certain amount of uh, engineering and glue and all sorts of things to just kind of work together. Yeah. So, yeah, this was, uh, this is not as ancient as you think, even though you use it, it's been used by kids in this one is aimed at kids. We did not use it for very kid-like things, although that one's a beautiful yeah, children's book. The, the book-like strange thing. thing about something like the IKEA pencil is that it it is a very, again, a new innovation. It's made to look like a pencil um, made from graphite or from any other solid pigment. But the thing is that these are often now uh, water-soluble dye materials that are mixed in with a binder. Uh, so it's a weird mix of what you thought a pencil used to be versus like a new thing that uses a dye, which is what makes these pencils water soluble, of course. Yeah, I mean, I always thought that a color pencil is just like a graphite pencil, but instead of a black color, they would have put a color color in there. Right. But they're, clearly, they're not the same at all. They're closer to, you know, like I said, they're like somewhere between crayons and watercolor pads and everything in between but it's a good way to as, do stuff as, as we get to modern times all of these kind of very strict distinctions between a pigment and an ink and a binder mm. and all of this starts to disappear as chemistry gets much more complex and I think that segues nicely to something very modern and of very modern times that is also in some ways ancient the Tachikawa school G pen for manga uh, all those terms mean something. They're not just something that I came up with on the fly. Uh, this is a fountain pen. It's a normal fountain pen. It uses Minjal's favorite thing, which is cartridges. It's not, you know, it's you don't have to dip these. Unlike if you saw our previous uh, roundup and our previous series, we had the hunt uh, nibs. Those you needed to actually just dip in there because there was nothing, the, the, there was no cartridge to help it along. So yeah, the nibs of the Tachikawa are usually something that's made for a dip pen because they're kind of flexible and artists use them to get these like variety of lines. Uh, This is a a nice cheap and cheerful portable cartridge based one uh, that we would used for these cheap and cheerful, well they're not really cheap, let's not undersell ourselves, these are works of art. Uh, (laughs) I enjoyed this one, It's, it's so nice to have this thing it's not a beginner pen. We we said that in our episode, and I think uh, we should reiterate that. But it's well worth having one of these. Well worth uh, using them for all these kinds of things, right? Yeah, I mean the the level of finesse that we could get out of these is, I think, something that we haven't seen matched by any other instrument we've used. The tachikawas, uh, I believe, are also very popular for uh, scripts like copper plate and uh, Spencerian. So calligraphy uh, practitioners will be aware of this, but these are very useful and much more convenient than actually carrying, you know, a, mm. an inkwell and like dip pen with you everywhere. So yeah, the Tachikawa pens are something that we highly recommend, but bringing it back to the development of, of inks and colors, the, the unique thing about the Tachikawa is that it's a, a version of a dip pen. And, um, in the world of dyes, which is what we were talking about, when things uh, moved from using plant dyes to using chemical dyes, so when a dye could be made in a laboratory, it could be made into this perfect, evenly colored liquid. And that is actually the first time that fountain pens even became possible. So this is actually uh, an icon of that change between a dip pen and a fountain pen. Mm. From the world of dyes and brushes and dip pens and fountain pens, we come to the modern age, which is ball pens, to begin with at least. And then over time, we came to gel pens. Uh, The interesting thing about these is that they turned all the rules of the ancient world of dyes and pigments on their head. A ball pen has a dye, which is a newer invention, slightly but it used an oil base instead of a water base. And then a few decades later, a gel pen came along and it used a pigment, but it used a water base. So these things really mixed it up. Yeah, and then you have this thing at the end, which is seemingly a magic trick. And we'll get into that. 
Now, the modern ball pen was kind of invented by a guy named Laszlo Biro. You may have used a th- pen called a Biro, but a lot of people have used something called a Bic, which is about as old as that. And was they got the license to make these kind of pens from Biro. Uh, but now the term Biro and Bic and you know ball pen are almost synonymous with each other. Uh, we love ball pens in this place. We we started off our test drive with a second. Our second episode was with the Reynolds, which is about as old as the rest of these as well. But I think of all of them, uh, the Bix were my favorite at least. What about you guys? Yeah, after uh, you know the harrowing uh, you know experience of using uh, the Pentels. We'll get to that. The Pentel RSVP. <laughs> we'll really, get to that. Uh, just diametric, uh, you know, end of the spectrum really is the big. The colors really surprised us, and uh, really smooth. They're a little uh, expensive, but you know if you get a chance to use the big. This is the big crystal uh, variant. The crystal up. The crystal up. Crystal up. So, uh, really, the big pens, uh, the ball pens are really, really worth trying. Hmm. And speaking of color, the colors are just so... Is that something to do with the oil-based pigment? Is that a specific thing I mean, about I, that? I, I mentioned that ball pens had a dye with an oil base. Now, these are modern ball pens. I'm guessing that's not true anymore. Hmm. That they have probably come up with some mix that's yeah, a completely different binder. Hmm. I don't... It's... The thing about the modern era and ball pens and gel pens in general is that all of those old dichotomies went out the hmm. window and people kind of came up with much more complex chemistries and binders. Yes, proprietary time. things, secret things that they won't tell us about. Uh, but the thing that we would like to tell you about, which Minjal has already said and we will reiterate, is that the... Uh, the well, let me get this. The, the Pentel RSVP BK95... You may have watched our episode. You may have seen us rant about this pen. It was as recent as last week. So, Minjal, do you have any energy left into you for more rants? Sure, I can go on for one more episode. (laughs) These fine pens are really not fine. And if Pentel uh, uh, RSVP is throwing a party, the three of us are definitely not attending. (laughs) Yeah, these these are the... Like Samir said, there have been so many innovations in these things. You don't quite know what is a ball pen, what is a gel pen anymore. Uh, but there are so many improvements in both the pigment and the, just the, the quality of life, so to speak, of how you use these. This reminded me of all the bad ball pen experiences I had growing up. Mm. Right? It's a throwback. It's a, It has no business looking so modern and being sort of a nice expensive in some ways thing to use when when you use it uh, despite all the very nice neat and beautifully shaded and you know surreal things that you can do with it uh, it's not fun to use and you know in in a world where the big crystal exists or even the old throwback like the Reynolds 045 countless gel pens that we are going to show you two of immediately after this you know this is just no, no, can't. I, I keep. I can't defend this in any way. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll just move on. Yeah, we'll move on from ball pens, which used to, at least traditionally, be dye based, to gel pens, which are still mostly pigment based. And gel pens that are so wonderful, while being so innocuous. The Papermate Ink Joy Gel Zero Point Five. One of the best gel pens I have ever had the pleasure of using. And it is a pleasure. It is a joy. It is just the most wonderful thing. Yeah, I think uh, I, this is probably the only object that three, the three of us, uh, I think, unanimously <laughs> yeah. voted for, you know, like uh, very positively. And unfortunately, these are not available in India where we're based. But, uh, you know, obviously, if you're in the US or any other part of the world, please go and get these. I mean, we talked in, in our episode on the Pentel and we talk about this, especially in ball pens that many times you you can try to put a line down and it isn't quite going to go where you want and that is not a problem with our favorite uh, fine liners like the unipins or the microns Uh, but this one this gel pen you can put a line down and it's going to go exactly where you want it which is a great joy and pleasure as i said Mm. and that's you know that's that hundreds and thousands of years of engineering have kind of come to this platonic ideal of what a gel pen should be for me 
yeah and something that not just is functional but also um fun to use and comes up with results that are just so vibrant and mm. well let's face it not very natural looking like yeah. these are unnatural colors yeah i mean if a caveman saw this they they would think it's magic i would hope yeah uh and speaking of magic i think that brings us to some one more gel pen or is it a ball pen or whatever it is i think it's a gel pen okay it's the pilot friction we have the pentels which we didn't like and then the paper mates which we loved and the pilots which uh frankly are very good pens they're just not necessarily for people like us and i know we say this every week that we're artists and calligraphers and designers we're kind of you know we're taking a weird thing and then most of the stuff we choose on this show is not necessarily totally art supplies and then things directly aimed at the artist level of stuff yeah. we like to go after the the sort of the, the the mass market the office and school supplies yeah and then see what you can do artistically with it and guess what the the frictions the pilot frictions are erasable so it's a ball pen or is it a gel pen it's a gel ink let's say whatever it goes down and then you deactivate it by rubbing it and i'll just let that sit in the air for a while <laughs> But yeah, you basically you put down a line, and then magically when you rub this, which is not an eraser, by the way, it's just a piece of like flexible rubber. Why does this happen? Um, it's because the friction inks are thermosensitive, mm. and so they they show their color only in a sort of relatively narrow band of temperature between minus ten and sixty degrees, which is our normal world. Well, so I want to say that uh, you know I don't know about you and uh, Vishal really. I am very old school. I like the Natraj uh, erasers compared to you know the friction plugs that are attached to almost all now a uh, pilot. Uh, well, well, like products. we said, these are not erasers. These are activators or rather deactivators. They are friction assistants. They are they are they are the opposite of other things. Uh, magic lamp. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. just say I'm happy being in the cave. I will wear sketchers, but I don't want these uh, pilot plugs. And speaking of sketch uh, caves, not sketchers. Uh, <laughs> I think this is a great range that we have inadvertently ended up doing in these past 12 weeks. Uh we have gone from lighting a fire and getting carbon black uh and then turning that into ink to getting an ink that you can heat up and make disappear. Yeah. Is that a a good uh, encapsulation of the journey we have been on in these last 12 weeks? Yes, and I think uh I mean the journey is not over because stationery is always changing as is technology but hmm. this is quite the range hmm like from something that anyone in a cave could have made quite yeah. easily actually yeah. to, to something, something that's I mean even Tony Stark probably couldn't have made this in a cave with scraps <laughs> let's face it <laughs> as far as we have come in the history of stationery and as much as we might have uh, bad mouthed the particular pentel uh, pen that we used Pentel is actually an essential part of the next step in the development of colors and stationery. From a long history of um, applying pigments and dyes through little narrow channels in metal or wood or reed, we came to the very very extremely modern innovation of having inks and pigments go through a felt tip pen. The felt tip pen itself was invented by Pentel. a japanese company as the the sign pen which they well literally invented for people to sign their names with and that has led to every fiber tip marker um sharpie highlighter every pen that you normally use today comes from that one source speaking of japanese companies the sakura koi company well the sakura company who makes the koi brand of very colorful pigments paints and in this case these brush pens which we really enjoyed you using uh, for all sorts of reasons and applications uh, we had a few uh, color related issues that 
I think were weird because like we, we a we didn't think that the the text descriptions that are on here were particularly great at conveying what it is, and then b we thought that the color or it's on the cap is not quite the same as you get on the paper, and that's like a real that's an issue of the of where like this is maybe if it's the same pigment it's the same pigment on this hard plastic, and then when mm. you put it on, you know even even if they were trying for that, I it's mean, very hard to. In, in a in a smaller set of pens, this would not be an issue, of course. But when you have a set of twenty four or forty eight colors, then it's yeah. useful to be able to identify visually what you're going to get. Yeah. But besides that, we really, really enjoyed these pens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've had our uh, you know share of using uh, bad brush pens. Yes, we have. Uh, maybe you can watch our episode on Bruce Show for that. <laughs> But uh, these we really enjoyed and uh, they're great for, um, you know, lettering. They're good for filling in color. They're good for drawing out shapes. So, you know, probably the best uh, economical, uh, you know, marker sets out there. They're certainly worth even not just economical, but as a treat. You know, you should treat your, treat yourself to 24 of these things and enjoy them. Uh, they're not too expensive but they are also going to give you a kind of experience that you are not going to get with any of the other tools we've got in here and we've had these for over five to six years and uh, you know out of the set of 24 maybe just two or three actually uh, dried out and you know mm. stopped working which is a lot to say for uh, brush yeah pens. yeah that's that's something you know we're talking about history and the longevity of time here the longevity of how long you have your uh, stationery and how long you can use it is a factor it's not you know we, we are not uh, advocating that you just buy things and not use them and then it's fine that they go bad, right? We want... Yeah, we, we need things to be dependable to the mm. point where they stick around for at least a few months or a few years. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A few years would be great. Um, but speaking of things that are in some ways ubiquitous to people's lives in, in an office setting, certainly, but you won't think of as in art thing and also something that we are not sure is going to last even on the page. Mm. Uh, these are highlighters. These are in fact the Luxor brand of highlighters. Luxor is a major uh, manufacturer in India and they export all over the world. These are their totally standard office fluorescent highlighters and we use them to color, to make uh, calligraphy, to make a portrait there. And yeah, I'm not sure if if we come back to these particular pieces of art mm. i know that the sumi ink which is again haha you know synergy and callbacks and all that stuff <laughs> uh the sumi ink that i used here may be still around but yeah. in a few years all this color may have gone that's quite possible because they were uh, highlighters have never been engineered for for longevity mm, yes and you know like we said we use uh mass market things m- many times maybe there is a neon colored artist uh, grade fade proof type thing out there a marker maybe there's a copic or something it's, it's possible but uh, again talking about the development of colors the point is the the sumi ink we know is dependable because it's been around for millennia and yeah it's been tested out we have examples of things maybe someone invented a highlighter back in the caveman days but we don't know what they were using <laughs> When it comes to pigments and dyes, the highlighter is one of the most modern innovations because you have, for the first time in history, in human history anyway, fluorescent inks. These are not colors that you find in nature at all, in any form. So there's nothing you can crush, there's nothing you can grind that will give you this color until the modern era. Markers themselves, as we were saying, were invented by Pentel and that only happened in the 1960s. Mm. Fluorescent things were also invented in the 1960s. So in some ways, this is uh, the product of exactly the same time frame. Mm. But we enjoyed using them for art. I don't know how... I mean, what is time anyway? We're all going to be fading at <laughs> some point. Uh, but I think I enjoyed this journey, both in this episode and over the last 12 weeks. Uh, do we have any more thoughts about this particular set? Um, about this set, no. But I think what we... Because this is the last piece of the 12 that we worked on over the past few weeks. 
the thing that has developed with colors over time and yes has led to something that we said as modern as maybe the luxor highlighter or the the friction gel pens these are probably the most modern things we tried out mm. but things continue to move and things continue to develop um, our other very very favorite coloring pen the posca paint markers hmm that is something that doesn't fit into any of these regular categories yeah it's it is a felt tip pen but the felt tip is kind of used like a brush because paint it's, kind of flows yeah. over it is it a pen is it a marker is it a brush you're not quite sure what that is and yeah. that's the thing as technology develops and as color technology develops the tools that we use will continue to change and get better but things that are old and dependable like the sumi ink and when it comes to pens something like a reed pen you can use a reed pen with a 2000 year old ink and you can probably use a reed pen with a 2 year old ink and it kind of works the same yeah i'm sure vanta black is probably being licensed somewhere to be turned into the blackest fountain pen pen ink ever we will go and investigate that sometime <laughs> and that has been our quick introduction to the 12 weeks past and the work we did on test drive and also a quick introduction over the history of colors pigments and dyes uh we hope you enjoyed this yeah we have done this now this show this stationary test drive for the past 52 weeks so that means that there are 52 episodes like this 48 tests and three other roundups like this which tell other stories about the history of stationery about the kind of things that we do with them uh, and if you are uh, if you made it this far thank you please uh, you know we, we thank you for sticking around and enjoying this hopefully uh, please let us know what you thought in the comments uh, and if you like stationery stories like this especially the ones that we told in this episode uh, do go to inkymemo.com which is on the the screen right now um there are stories there are transcripts of a lot of these episodes uh, there is a newsletter with many stories of the history of stationery and stationery people um we are going to be back next week for a little short extra episode but this actually marks the end of the first year mm -hmm. of stationery test drive and we are going to be talking about that year uh, separately so if you are interested in that if you are interested in our journey of being total youtube novices uh to making this show consistently and making the work that goes on the show for the last one year week on week we've come out every week so far thankfully uh we'll see when this one comes out but you know uh until then you should maybe even follow us on the the social links in the screen uh tell us what you think of the show of this episode of everything else uh we'll see you next week uh for that episode where we are going to talk a little about the actual show uh until then i'm vishal this is ninjal i'm samir and if you like this roundup you really need to look at our previous roundup which was all sorts of stationery that took us back to school and also maybe you'd like our first roundup which we did many many moons ago vishal it's black and white and red all over <laughs>